Oh, I think I think I'm live. Hello and welcome back to Creative Pet Giving. My name is Katya. I am your host and it's been quite a while since I did a live stream and I'm really excited because I don't know, I kind of forgot about live streaming and I forgot how fun it is to hang out with all of you guys, especially be able to chat with you guys now. Unfortunately, I didn't warn anybody that I was going to go live, so it's kind of like, poof, I appeared. So we'll see if anyone joins us or if they don't. And they don't, that's okay, because I still have some cool stuff to talk to you about that hopefully you will find interesting if you replay this video. And oh, we've got uh, people popping in. I'm so excited. Yay, hello and welcome. So I thought that we will take a mini break from me showing you updates on the beta spawning series and kind of not only answer some questions, but also help you figure out what to do when your bettas can't spawn. Because this is something that I think if I were to collectively collect all of the questions that are often sent to me, when it, whether it's through emails or DMs or YouTube comments or comments on other social media, the most common thing I hear are questions about, oh, I can't get my bettas to spawn because A, B, and C. And there's so many different types of circumstances and over the years, as I've spawned more and more bettas, I've had successes as well as failures. And through those, I have not only learned a couple things that I hope to share with you, but I also really like to lurk in Facebook groups of breeders as well. So I kind of see what issues other people uh, run into as well as how other breeders who are much more experienced than I am kind of solve those particular issues. So we're not going to dive like too hardcore deep into it, but we will kind of discuss some of the very common things that can happen because even though uh, I currently just showed you in the previous video that I've had some success with the Tancho pair, I did have a failure of a spawn with another pair, which I don't want to spoil it for you, so I'm not going to tell you. And then I had a breeding that, another breeding that kind of was successful in terms of the two fish attempted to spawn, but that did not produce any viable offspring. And then I had a fourth breeding that was a success. Well, technically one, it's not really four breedings because one was a never happened breeding. And I'm going to be a little vague because I don't want to spoil anything because in the next video that you'll see or the next next video, because I might have a sponsored video by Aquarium Co-op next week. And then after that, I will update you guys so you guys can see what happened with the spawn. So I'm not going to like dive into it too deeply to spoil anything. But you kind of know now that I've had one success another success that you don't know which pair, a failure, and then a almost success that failed. So that is like your first little kind of uh, tidbit and tip. So before I kind of dive into it, I'm going to say hello to everybody. I'm looking at all of the people that are popping in. We've got uh, Rosie and Fishy Business and Jolie. Uh, and I don't think I know how to pronounce this. Chen, Cheng, Cheng maybe. But it's from uh, Ting from Kelly. There you go. Watching my videos for years. Oh, I'm really happy to hear that. That's one of the things that um, I really miss about live streaming is I really miss talking to you guys. I just kind of forgot about live streams and I stopped doing them for a little while. I don't know why. There's no like particular reason. And then today I was filming and working on another video and I thought um, instead of putting out a video tomorrow, why don't I just hang out with you guys instead? So I hope that that is okay. And I hope that you enjoy this as well. And then next week we'll have some fun videos. So I'm going to check into the comments again. We have Papa Shrimp and Aquatic Express and Dragon Fox and Jessica from Idaho. Man, it's really awesome. So really happy to see everybody join me today. So let's talk about betas breeding. Uh, beta breeding can be quite a tricky thing. It can be a complicated thing, but at the same time, it can also be kind of easy because you can get lucky sometimes, which can make it easier, or it can be super, super complex. In comparison, if I were to compare spawning bettas to other fish, now I've bred guppies, which are like on the easy spectrum, and then a variety of different cichlids, I would say better breeding, maybe for me particularly, kind of falls into the more difficult category because pairs can oftentimes be incompatible. And that is something that we can sometimes prepare for, 
For example, choosing pairs that have a good size that matches. So you always want, for example, a male that is slightly larger than the female so he can properly wrap her. And that's something you can kind of select for and prepare for yourself. But even if you do so, there are still things that work out because A, fish kind of do what fish want to do. But also you have to keep in mind that when you spawn these fish, they are doing everything just solely based on their instinct alone. And that means that they might not entirely know how to spawn, which is I know sounds kind of weird because we would assume that by instinct, all animals know how to reproduce. But sometimes, especially in the wild, you know, animals, when they try to reproduce, sometimes they don't get it right the first time and they have opportunities to attempt to either try again or try to spawn with other partners. And in captivity, we have to have some of that flexibility and patience as well because we can't oftentimes expect fish to just spawn right away on the first try and know exactly what to do, even though some fish do figure it out. So if you look at my tancho pair, for example, I would consider that like a really easy successful spawn because that pair right away, um, even though usually most of my pairs spawn in early in the morning, that pair ended up spawning kind of like midday-ish they kind of figured it out. It was really great. Then what happened with my other pair, which was the candy koi pair. I'll dive into it a little bit. In that particular case, the male got everything right except one important detail. So he built a bubble nest. Check. He did the little wiggle dance where they do the little shimmy shimmy and they were like, hey girl, you want to spawn? He did that too. So check. Female was interested and engaged and was observing him when she was separated from him. So that is also positive. And she started to posture downwards. So I couldn't really rely on breeding stripes because with marbles, you, the breeding stripes don't show up. So you can't really see them. But she, you know, she did the whole like proper body language. So I was like, okay, positive, positive, really great. I released the pair together uh, that night, the next day. I'm checking in on them and I see that the female is sort of like watching the male from the back of the tank, but she's like, not sure because she wants to approach, but you know, you can tell that like she's a little intimidated and that happens sometimes because males can be quite aggressive and can intimidate the female. So I'm like, okay, let me observe them a bit more and see what is going on. And I see the male doing his little, you know, wiggle wiggle under the, uh, Indian almond leaf under his nest. And then I see the female swim over and I'm like, oh, there we go. Positive. She's coming over to check things out. And as soon as she would come right under the nest, he would like bite her and scare her away. And I would sit there and over the past, like, I think half an hour, I would just see them constantly repeat this behavior. So she would come over and then he would shoo her away and he would entice her to the nest and then shoo her away, entice her to the nest and shoo her away. And the problem was that the male was too aggressive under the nest. And my theory is that uh, males in general, after they spawn, will protect their nest fiercely. Obviously, there was no eggs, there was no spawning, but I think he still had the instinct to protect the nest. So even though he wanted the female to come over, he was still like, but I must protect. So he would scare her away. And then if, after a while, I would, would check in. I would just leave him alone, let them kind of work it out. And I would check in on them a couple times during the day. And when that happened, I still noticed the same thing. It would just kept repeating over and over again. And the female would just kind of let him do it. So she would let him like bite her and shoo her away. And then she never really like retaliated or let him know that, hey, like that's not an incorrect behavior. If you want to spawn, you know, you can't do that. We have to spawn under the leaf. And I've seen females in the past. Uh, I don't I don't want to say reprimand a male because I don't feel like that is the correct terminology. But I've, I've seen them correct a behavior that was unwanted. So from my observation, I noticed that when betta spawn, especially for the very first time, you know, it takes like two to tango and they both will kind of teach each other, um, correct each other and figure it out together. And you need to have 
this cooperation. In this case, there was like not that cooperation, which was an issue. So I figured that I should probably try to put that male with an alternative female, and that would have been the yellow female, which was slightly more aggressive. So when I would flare them, I would notice that that female, if the male was really aggressive during flaring, it, he would, you know, bite and attack the glass, even though he couldn't get to her, she would actually kind of flare and be like, hey, stop, like that is too much. So she would be the type of female that would like correct that over aggression. So that is the pair that I ended up attempting next. And that is something that I wonder if I should continue the story in this particular live stream, or if you would like for me to talk about that in the next upcoming video. So I'm going to check in in the comments as a little pause to my story. So let's see, we've got more people popping in. We've got more people commenting. Oh, I should change it to uh, live chat just so I don't miss anybody because it was top chat. Um, I have some really great tips already. Bubble wrap helps to breathe. Yes, that is definitely helpful. And I think I should probably talk about that too in a little bit. Um, what is your favorite part about breeding bettas? I think the spawning for sure, because I think it is so, so interesting to see just how much the fish are communicating. And the more I have bred bettas in the past, the more over time I have started to learn to understand their body language. I feel like I still have quite a bit to learn because I would say at this point, I'm not a beginner breeder anymore. I'm an intermediate breeder, but I'm not an, like a master breeder either. So I'm like in the middle where I feel pretty confident and I have like tried to amass the knowledge and experience that I'm starting to understand and see a lot of things that I would have missed in the past. And one of the most interesting things is having the privilege to revisit some of my older videos. So one of the exciting things about, you know, documenting my hobby is not only do I get to share it with all of you guys, but I also get to then reference some of my older footage. And the interesting thing about that is I will notice things that I have not noticed in the past because you know how that uh, saying goes, you don't know what you don't know. Well, you know, there's certain things that I've learned now that I can recognize. The one thing that is like kind of more sad to knowing more things is now if I look at some of my older, older footage, like I would say from like five or more years ago, if there was a ever, ever, I'm getting a little mumbly with my words. If there was ever any disease that was starting to, um, I guess, progress on any of my fish, and the younger Kasha from the past uh, might have not noticed until the disease progressed a bit more and then I would try to treat it. Now I can catch it sooner in my video. So I've seen a couple of my older videos where fish were starting to get a little sick for whatever reason. And I see it and I, I look at it and I'm just like, oh, I wish me like in the past would have been able to see it because the earlier you can... Uh, notice or you know spot disease the earlier you can identify to the best of your ability and try to treat it the better chance you have of you know helping your fish overcome whatever they have so i guess they're you know pros and cons pros and cons but let me check in on the comments again i have a tendency that i like to ramble and talk i know there's a lot of people uh in the youtube community the live stream that are really really great at checking in comments I'm kind of, I have to remind myself to do that every now and then. So if I miss some of your comments, sorry about that. But, you know, I want to keep it equal, uh, answer questions, hang out with you, but also try to like share some cool content uh, with you guys. So to do, why not both? That is actually a good idea. What I can do is I can do like a, a longer story, a longer form story without hopefully spoiling too much because I don't really want to spoil too much for you guys. And then... I can do like a shorter summary of what was going on in my next upcoming video next week. Cause I want to go over what happened so that people can see it again, because I do have some footage. I don't have all of the footage though. Cause uh, I did spend a lot of time just sitting and observing my fish. And I find that sometimes when I film, then I get distracted 
filming and then I'm not paying attention as much to what my fish are doing. And sometimes I just want to just enjoy observing the natural behaviors of my fish without being like, okay, now I got to set up the camera. I got to like turn off all the lights, try to prevent glare and then like do this and do that, you know. So that's kind of the thing. So where we left off, the candy koi pear clearly was not working out. So at that point, I thought to myself, okay, I could either call this a fail and just completely be like, okay, we're not going to try to spawn this pair, or I can give this pair another try or two and see what happens. And in the past, old me would have just probably given up on a pair because I've done that before where they just didn't spawn. And I was like, okay, it didn't work. But now the more experienced me is like, okay, let's, you know, give it another try. Let's see, can we... Uh, change some of the things that are happening to help help change this into from a fail to a success. So I thought to myself, okay, I have the yellow female who is also eggy. And she was another female that I was considering spawning to the candy uh, male anyways. So she was kind of ready to go. So I was like, let me try them again. But, 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 but the important part is before I wanted to try to spawn those two, knowing that the yellow female was more aggressive, she would correct the male and hopefully help kind of curb that behavior that I didn't want. I wanted to completely change the surroundings. So when something doesn't work for you in terms of spawning, it could be the pair, but in some ways it can also be the environment as well. So oftentimes when I set up my spawning tanks, I like to go for my five gallons because they're kind of smaller. I like to use, you know, glass aquariums for filming purposes. So that way I can document it a lot better and share it with you guys. But if you see how a lot of people in Asia breed their fish overseas, oftentimes they will use a lot of containers that are solid colored. So you can't really see through them. And there are a variety of different containers. Some of them are, you know, square or rectangle and kind of shallow. There's certain like round buckets people use. And in the past, I have spawned in my bucket. That's where the bucket that a spawn came from. So I thought to myself, if I'm going to attempt to spawn this male, which clearly didn't work the first time, not only do I have to try him with a different female, I have to change the environment that he's in because part of the reason that the spawn was not working out could have also been the environment. And in this case, could have been the fact that I add a lot of Indian almond leaves and hiding spots in my tank. Now, the reason I do that mostly for spawning that's worked for me in the past is that that means that when I do walk away from my aquarium, if the male gets really, really aggressive, like really wants to kick the female out of the territory, she can hide. She has lots of hiding places so she can be safe until I just check on her, notice what's going on, and then remove her because there is really a lot of risk involved with spawning bettas. Sometimes you can get lucky and fish won't nip each other at all. I've had that happen to me. Like, for example, Arnold was a great example of a male that was very gentle with Anna when they spawned. Um, they didn't nip each other at all. He didn't like really beat her up at all. She didn't beat him up. It was great. It was like a very low stress spawning experience. With the Tancho pair, they did go after each other a bit. But once again, there was not really any damage involved. Because in the videos, you can see both the male and the female had like pretty intact fins. So I was like, yes, this is great. Because I don't have to stress about these fish getting injured. But what I noticed with the candy pair is the female had some fin, like her nip fin, blah, I can't words, that ha happens sometimes. I need a moment, water break. This happens to me all the time. And if this was like a video I'm recording for creative pet keeping, I'll get, I'll talk about a topic and then I'll get really tongue tied. This would be the moment where I would like pause and start again, but we'll continue. Um, so where was I? I had a, also, I sometimes my brain goes a little blank too. This is a blank moment. Okay, Candy Koi, he was spawning Fin Nip. There we go. We're back. We're back on track. Yes. So he nipped her quite a bit. It wasn't really bad, but at that point, I'm like, you know, showing some concern because, you know, I don't really want my fish to get injured. So I noticed that when he was nipping her a lot, she was spending a lot of, the more he would do it, the more she would start hiding in the tank amongst the Indian almond leaves and the more she wanted nothing to do with the male. 
So of course I separated the pair. I gave them a few days of like quiet time, no flaring, just jarred, kept feeding them so that they can kind of reset a little bit. And then I set up the bucket to try to spawn the candy mail in the bucket because I thought, let me just completely change the environment as well as the female so that we can try again. And in this case, I didn't really put many Indian almond leaves. I only put a little bit just so the female can hide a bit. But for the most part, it was just empty with a floating, um, like a plastic, not a plastic thing. It was like um, the packing material. I wasn't using bubble wrap, but it was something similar to that. It was the same thing I was using, um, excuse me, for the previous tank. I put that up, put a heater in there. Um, normally, I would actually put a filter in there as well because I like adding sponge filters. But in this case, I ended up not putting in a sponge filter at all. So it was super simple, like no distractions kind of happening. Not really much for the female to hide. So at this point, she's kind of stuck having to like look at him and being like, okay, you guys have to figure it out together. But at the same time, um, she could hide if she wants to. And then I planned to kind of babysit this pair a bit more so that because there's less places for her to hide, and even though this female had more attitude, and I know she could probably hold her own, but a fish, of course, can damage each other. So I was like, I'll watch them very closely. So for that particular spawn attempt, I noticed that right away she was handling the male a lot better. She wasn't really nipping him or being like really aggressive with him at all. It's just any time she came up under the nest and was interested... Uh, he would, you know, try to chase her away and she would flare him and be like, no, what are you doing? Don't do that. So that was really positive because as I was observing them, I noticed that instead of chasing her away after a while, because she was like, no, every time he tried to do that, and she'd be like, no, he tried to chase her away. And she'd be like, what are you doing? Stop that. I don't know. Something happened where he started to, I guess, understand a bit better. And he stopped doing that. So I was like, yes, we're making progress because now he's, you know, under the nest, he's dancing. If she comes over to him, he's like, hey, girl, doing my little wiggle, wiggle dance, the shimmy, shimmy, right? Oh, <laughs> and I just saw the comment. He just wanted a spicy lady. Yes, yes, almost. Because um, the downside is, unfortunately, they didn't spawn. And, it, and this time, it was not because of him, it was actually because I put the female in a little too early. She, upon like really good close look, I noticed that she was like not eggy enough to really spawn. And that was kind of okay with me because I just wanted him to get the learning experience. So they were not together for too long. They were together for, I would say about 24 hours before I ended up separating them because the next day, um, after a while, she kept correcting him, correcting him, but because she was not ready to spawn just yet, you could, she was still quite eggy, and because she's transparent, you could see all the eggs, but she was not as plump as I would have normally put a female for spawning. You can tell, like, she would be interested, but then uh, she wasn't showing the body language that she was interested. So she would check out the nest, but then she would be like, nah, not really. So I was like, okay, she's definitely not ready to go. And I separated them because at that point he did nip her fin a little bit too. And I was, I didn't want her to get really injured. So I separated them and I was like, okay, will putting the, the candy female with this male work? So I kind of thought about it because I knew that his behavior was a lot better. And at that time, the candy female did something really funny because she was really ready to go. So she was an example of a really well-conditioned female. Like she was chunky, like thick with three C's. Okay. And she started, when I had her jarred and waiting while I was feeding her, it kept conditioning her. Um, and while the yellow, the candy male was with the yellow female, she started building her own bubble nest. And then she started dropping her eggs and just, just putting them there because she was just so eggy, which, you know, in, in some ways was kind of like a little sad and frustrating because I was like, no, don't drop your eggs. I need those for your spawn. But at the same time, I've never caught on film a female 
like just having her eggs. I didn't catch her actually dropping them, unfortunately, but um, I did at least get that because a lot of people ask a lot of questions about female bettas. I feel like female bettas are really misunderstood. So the fact that I got that footage was helpful because I could use that in a future video where I'm explaining how females on their own, they don't need a male, they can drop eggs on their own. And female bettas only really very rarely get egg bound when they physically can't release the eggs. But in this particular case, she was a really healthy girl, great shape, was like, okay, well, you know, I want to spawn. I'm in the, I'm ready. I had a male. He was weird. Um, now I'm alone. I'm still eggy. I need to take care of this myself. So that was kind of, you know, what happened. So at that point, I was like, okay, this is a sign that clearly she's she's at least super ready to go. So we know the problem is the male, right? So I put them together again. I put them in the bucket. And this time, as soon as I put them together, it was so, so like positive looking. I was so hopeful because she just went right for him and was like, I'm ready. You know, she just swam right, did the right posture, was like, hey. And then he was like, hey, girl, wiggle, wiggle dance and was not like shooing her away. But once again, it's, I, I also need to name this male. Like he needs a name. Cause he's, he's got, you know, he's a, he's a funny boy. We can't blame him for not knowing what to do. Cause he's just a fish, but the instincts were just, they were just not kicking in. You know, the conditions were right. And it was just not happening. And like, he'd even try to like attempt to wrap her. So at this point, he, they were just kind of hanging out. They were starting to become roommates and he started to get frustrated after a while and started chasing her around again. So I was like, okay, before this female like gets traumatized and learns to hate all male bettas because of her not so great experience, because after a while, if you expose a fish to anything like repetitively, that's a negative experience, even if it's something instinctual like spawning, you know, you could teach a fish to not want to spawn or become fearful of males. And at this point, the candy female was still like, you know, even though he was kind of mean to her, it wasn't a bad enough experience where she was like, nope, not interested in any boys. Um, she was still okay. So I was like, I don't want to ruin her. But at that point, I was like, okay, he's, I th I'm pretty sure, like 99% sure he's the problem. But let me test and see what would happen if I paired this female with an experienced breeder. And who did I have that just recently spawned and had experienced breeding? The Tancho male. Because, and I thought that this would be like a good combination too, because I, even though I did the Tancho pair together and it's a sibling, first generation like sibling spawn, I wanted to breed the Tancho male to originally the yellow female, but I was okay with breeding him to the candy female as well. Cause I just wanted to see what kind of marbles that would produce. So I was like, maybe this will work, but this girl is chunky and the Tancho male is not as big as the candy male. He's just ever so slightly smaller. And with the Tancho female it was great. The Tancho female was like perfect size for him. It all worked out really great, but this girl was chunky. Ideally, if I were to like match her with the perfect size male that could handle all this like egginess and, and girth, uh, it would have been the male that I have in this tank right here, the orange uh, giant. But he's a pet fish and I never had any spawning plans for him. So I didn't want to like willy nilly spawn a fish that was not conditioned, not prepared. And then he's in the, in the community tank, so he's not ready for it. So I was like, no, nah, even though. Like logically, size-wise, that would be a good matchup. And they would probably produce some really nice marbles. Um, I didn't really want to do that. But I was willing to try her with the Tancho male, even though um, I wasn't sure if it would work. And I feel like at that point... Let's see, how far do I want to tell you without spoiling too much? Let's check. Let's do another pause. I'll check in on the comments again because I was rambling so much. So let's see what you guys have been 
um, saying, uh, I have one comment, I have some males that have no interest in any females. That does happen. That is totally true. Same goes for some females. Some females, no interest. They don't want to. So we have to, you know, think about color when we inform and health and temperament when it comes to breeding. And in my like personal case, I, I care about temperament as well as health too. So if I have a male that's like really highly aggressive or a female that's like really highly aggressive, and I mean like really like wants to really harm the other fish, I would not spawn them either. Because one of the problems that we have right now with bettas being so aggressive nowadays is because they were, you know, bred for a fighting sport and they were selectively bred for aggression. And when you do that, you create more aggressive fish. Now I think that's not really much of a problem because now we're uh, breeding bettas mostly for looks. And I've, I did notice bettas are getting more and more docile, which is kind of nice. Like they're like a, a reasonable docile because you don't want your bettas to be like completely docile either. Cause there has to be that like little bit of aggression during spawning. It's just part of the whole spawning ritual. So you want a little bit, but you don't want like a lot and then you don't want none. So you want to like, you know, get the little special amount of, I guess, aggression, which sounds, it sounds so weird, but, Oh, I forgot to tell you, I have a little secret and one thing that I sometimes do that helps kind of trigger spawning other than picking times when it's raining. Another thing that I do is if I, f if I put a pair together and they're kind of distracted, maybe I came up to the tank and they're like, Oh, hello, pellet giver. Are you going to give us some pellets and give us some numbs? And then they start thinking about food and they're not thinking about spawning. How do I kind of reset their brain to focus on spawning again is I will add a very small amount. And I mean, like, let's say if, I were pouring this bottle, it would be like this much of cold RO water. So RO water, you know, all the minerals are out. So it'll be much lower pH. So it kind of simulates rain, right? And because it's cold, that also simulates rain. That helps a lot. I don't know why adding just a little bit of that, they, you could, you could just feel like they realize the change. Like they feel the change and they're like, oh, oh, it is the rainy season maybe we should spawn. I don't know why. That's something I really want to talk about more because it's been really, really helpful in like getting fish to spawn. So uh, let's go back to my story. So I wanted to try the Tancho male who was really experienced. No, not really experienced. Let's take that back. He only had one successful spawn. So not really experienced, but compared to the candy, like clearly way more. So I wanted, and plus he's also very nice and he's gentle. Uh, so I was like, this would be, maybe, maybe it would work. But a part of me was like, the size issue, mm, he might have a hard time wrapping her. So I still put them together. But this time, once again, I wanted to, to switch environments a third time. Because, you know, you got to experiment with not only different pairs, but once again, always switch up the container or the setup that you have for spawning. As long as you're meeting the basic kind of requirements of you want water not too high. You want like a smaller sized container, nothing too large. You want to make sure it's heated and has a consistent temperature. You want to cover the top so there is all that humidity that starts to build at the top. And as long as you give the fish a spot to build a nest, even if you don't, potentially they could still figure it out and, and kind of build a nest. But sometimes giving them something, a structure to build a nest under makes it easier. As long as you have like those basic things from there, you can sort of experiment and mess with um, the parameters to a certain extent and start changing things. Now with the water parameters, I kind of keep it the same, but what I mess with is how many like decorations are in the tank. So hiding spots in terms of like the Indian almond leaves, do I add a filter? Do I not add a filter? Because the filter can be a distraction. The bubbles that it uh, puts out or will, even if it's set to a low output, does create a sound. So sometimes sounds can be distracting movements, uh, reflections, uh, the ability for a fish to see um, other the surroundings can be a distraction. So, you know, you got to like change these things around, right? 
So I decided to try a Critter Keeper. The Critter Keepers are, you know, those tiny plastic containers that you can get at, like, I think PetSmart or Petco. I like to use them as, like, temporary experimental containers for a variety of things. So I always have them on hand. And this was uh, the larger Critter Keeper. And I thought it would be cool to place it right here, right over here. This way I can get some natural light. So I'm not using artificial lighting. I thought maybe, like, you know, having access to natural light would maybe help affect the spawning in some way. Having it closer to my window, because my window's right here, as it was a rainy week, that's also helpful because I can open it and the change in uh, pressure will help trigger fish to spawn too. And I thought it would be a cool opportunity to just film in a different kind of setting. So I put them together and that one was really promising because as soon as I put them together the female was like hello I would like to spawn because remember she's like really eggy she's just ready to go and the male was like hey girl I just had some kids but I had I had like what was it like three four day break and he's like I'm ready to go because with females you got to give them some more space and conditioning males they can kind of spawn um more often because obviously like for sperm production, even though they spawn, it's easier for them to, you know, produce more sperm in their body. For females, it takes a little longer to um, produce more eggs. So he was definitely ready to go, even though he had a little bit of a break in between. And they started to kind of try to spawn. And you can tell it was a little difficult because he knew how to wrap. He's already had the experience of, of wrapping, but this girl, she's she's a thick girl. And when one of the main things that like you always hear people talk about when it comes to wrapping is when the female is upside down, they say that the male squeezes the female to squeeze out the eggs. Well, that's not entirely correct. The female actually released the eggs on her own. The reason he's squeezing is he's more so just holding on so that he can be in the right position when he releases his sperm as she releases her eggs so that they can mix that that way he can fertilize the eggs and that's why he's kind of holding on if he's not he will slide off and he won't be able to position himself correctly to be able to fertilize the eggs so i don't know if at this point i should leave you with a cliffhanger and let you kind of look forward to finding out if that spawn ended up being successful or not. But I really wanted to just kind of walk you through the entire process of some of the things that I, you know, I troubleshoot and I look at, you know, when I try to spawn different fish. And in the future, um, I what I would like to do is get multiple males and females of the same color and um, fin types so that I can better mix and match pairs to see if a certain pair is not compatible, maybe another pair. Like if I had another candy male, I think there would have been a higher chance that maybe it would have particularly at least with candy pairs would have worked out. Uh, and that's something that uh, is a lesson that, you know, I think I learned from this particular spawn because in the past I've got lucky where either the fish I had spawned or they didn't. And then I would just sort of, you know, move on and I would not keep trying again. In this particular spawn, I wanted to experiment more and see what would happen. And I think the biggest takeaway so far, I think, is that the behaviors of bettas really, they, they do affect each other, the way they communicate, the way they learn. And you do have to give fish time to get in a spawning mindset because this whole time like they're either in a cup or a tank and even though they may be building a bubble nest and maybe like a male might be interested in spawning it takes a while for a male to actually like get in the spawning mode and you can't rush these things and let's check in on the comments once again to do because i haven't checked first of all we're joined in by a lot of people oh Kelly is here. Sam, Sam says hello. So Sam is one of the uh, bettas from the Unicorn Bucket Baby Spawn. So is it one of the most fun thing about um, 
uh, breeding and selling fish to you guys is that later on I can like get updates and I can see how they're doing. And it's so exciting because I feel like, um, well, I enjoy them while I have them. It is kind of sad to let my fish go because I try not to get like too, too attached to my fish, but I kind of still really do. <laughs> so it's really nice to be able to see, you know, how they're doing. And technically the Tancho pair are the siblings to, to Sam. So it'll be cool, you know, for like Kelly to be able to see the siblings of her fish spawn and, you know, produce offspring. Now we don't know if the, the, uh, Tancho and the candy female spawned or not. Well, I mean, I know because it's in the future. I've been sort of filming these videos ahead of time. And then as I release them, uh, we're, I think I'm like a week and a half or two weeks behind. So anytime you see the video updates right now, I'm already raising babies, but you'll get to see them later on. And I wanted to do that differently this time because in the past, I've done a variety of different things. I've done on uh, my first spawn ever, I did complete like updates as they happened because I was like, okay, this is my first spawn ever. I'm a complete beginner. Like I want to share everything because I need, not only do I feel prepared in, to a certain extent because I did as much research and as much like binge watching of other people and prep as I could, but I still will probably need the help of other people as I go through this. And I want to have other people kind of experience everything. So that was that. Then spawns after that, I kind of pre-plan my videos a bit better so they can be more so like educational videos. And in this particular case, I'm focusing a bit more on the pairs and spawning and that process. I'm not focusing on the babies as much right now. I will be focusing on them when they get a little bigger. So you'll still see them, but we're not going to focus as much on the little tiny babies and how they're doing. We're going to see what, how they developed into later on. And of course, I'll be holding some back so then even though I'll be selling a, a big chunk at Aquashella in Chicago, that's coming up in October, which is also another exciting thing I've never done before. I've never actually brought my fish to like a cool fish event where people can purchase my fish. And then I can see like who's purchasing my fish like there at the thing. So that's, that's really going to be super fun, but I'll also be holding some fish back. So this will be like a really fun uh, experience. I hope. And it's really exciting. So I think I will let you leave you kind of like on a cliffhanger where you're not going to know what happened with that pair. And also another little like teaser, because I don't want to like spoil everything for you guys, because I, I don't know. I feel like this is exciting. And, you know, that way you guys can look forward to some stuff. Um, I haven't mentioned the red uh, star tail pair, because I also attempted to spawn those and we don't know, like, did it work? Did it fail? What kind of shenanigans occurred in that one? I think I'll leave those two things for the future video. So you guys have something to look forward to, but I think it's kind of, now I'm glad that I explained all the shenanigans that happened with the candy pair because it was quite a lot. And I feel like maybe it would have been too much or too long for a video, I feel like I would have really had to cut it short. So I'll probably go over it and like summarize it, but it was really fun to just kind of explain it to you in just like a normal conversational way, you know, that's kind of like fun, fun, fun. And also I should check in on everybody. Also, I will probably end this stream maybe in like 10 minutes or so. Cause um, my husband is on his way home and he's going to bring me foods. So I'm excited about that. Um, and he's going to be here probably soon. So I don't want to be on here too long, even though I kind of really enjoyed talking to you guys and it's been such a long time and it's, it's really nice to actually get to talk to you live because it feels like we're, we're hanging out together and I'll actually really quick tell you the reason why I reminded myself to do live streams again is because, you know, even though I'm a YouTuber and you guys watch me. I also watch other YouTubers and a lot of them are like not in the fish keeping. I do watch other fish keepers, but um, I do watch a lot of other genres. And I had a, uh, a YouTuber that I've been watching for quite a while. She did a live stream and this week and I popped in to her channel, like her live stream. And I was saying hi. And it was kind of like fun to just kind of fangirl and be like, I watch your videos. Yeah. And it was like really exciting because then she was reading the comments and like, to be acknowledged 
by her. It was like, yay. I was like really happy. So that reminded me like how how exciting and fun it is to be able to hang out with the creators that we watch. So I need to do that more. And also, I got a super chat. Oh, I haven't gotten a super chat in such a long time. So I got it from Kevin and Lisa. And this is really enjoying your better breeding series. Great camera work and great info. Thank you for educating us and looking forward to the next video. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it because um, one of the things I stress about the most is the way I film everything because um, I feel like filming fish is kind of hard. It's hard to sometimes focus on fish and deal with glare and reflections. And you can't always set things up. So for example, when I'm filming myself, I can pick a day where it's like sunny and like hopefully I'm looking kind of okay. And um, I can always do a voiceover. Like there's some factors I can control with videos, like unboxing videos. I can control like how it looks so that I'm like, this is satisfactory. But with fish, you can't force fish to do specific things or be in a specific place or do what you want them to do. Fish do what they want to do. So it's more so like, me just hoping for the best and just like trying to make it work. Um, and sometimes it's a little hard, but I'm also kind of a perfectionist. Um, so I'm always kind of like really hard on myself sometimes because I really, I want to show you the very best I can in the best way I can. So yeah, that's kind of my thing. And I, there is one spawn from the Better Breeding series that I missed. And I don't want to tell you which one that is, but I completely wasn't just not there. I had to... I'll leave the house to go grocery shopping. And that is when that pair decided to spawn. When I came back, there was eggs. And I was like, <sighs> we missed out on that particular one. But that's okay. You know, I can't, as much as I try to like really babysit my, my spawns to try to get the footage for you guys, uh, that one I missed. And that's like the one downside is you can try to set up so that your fish will hopefully spawn at a specific time. But really like, even though most of my bettas in the past have spawned early, like first thing in the morning, bettas can spawn whenever. So when I do this betta breeding series, like I have no plans for like the entire week or sometimes two weeks that this whole thing is happening. And I am home like all the time, like a crazy person checking on my fish, like every uh, hour to see like, are they, cause I don't want to miss anything. Or even if they're not spawning, like what if they're doing something interesting? Like I want to be able to also document it for myself. Um, I could show you, cause I love sharing this on my desk over here. Where did it go? I'm shuffling through my stuff. I have my little beta breeding journal where I've been like documenting things. And I love doing that as well. I don't know where I put it. Maybe it's not, oh, it's right here. It was under the uh, fluval, not fluval. The Phoenix light. I, I have it right here. That's the last one that's on. And then over here, I have these tanks on a little longer because this is where the, at the corner, right over there, you won't be able to see them, but that's where the babies, two baby tanks are. And I have it on a little longer because I want them to be able to see the brine shrimp that I've been feeding them. Um, they need a light longer for that. But I have my little spawning journal right here. Now I have a dedicated video where I actually go over all of the things. And look at this. I'm such a nerd. I made little pie charts of everything. I have all my details that I log because I also have a really bad memory. So this is kind of like how I just because I'm forgetful. So this is how I sort of like keep track of everything so I can look back on these things and try to learn. And I've been logging all of the what's been happening. So the fail, the what was successful, what wasn't. And then I try to write down like why so i'll talk about you know was the female ready was the male not ready uh what was their condition um when i added them together when they tried like i have dates and stuff it's, it's really really fun i like documenting this um in the future when i go to aquashellas even the next one that's coming up in chicago because unfortunately i can't make it to the dallas one part of the reason is I actually really wanted to be home to take care of these babies because they're in they're at that really young stage where um, I just need to kind of be checking in on them all the time and give them small but very frequent meals throughout the day. So I have to be home. So I, I couldn't leave my babies and I really wanted to go to Dallas Agrochella. Then I was like, Dallas Agrochella or prioritizing baby bettas, even though like Daniel could have taken care of them. I was like, mm, I just, I need to take, I need the babies. I need to take care of the babies. So I'm not going that one. 
but the Chicago one I will be. So I'm considering bringing this with me. So like, if you come to the, you know, to the booth that we're at, the creator booth, if you want like to kind of look at my notes, I guess, you know, I mean, if I was somebody that was watching someone else on YouTube, going through like a series of something and you know, they had stuff, I would want to take a look at it. So I'm hoping that because I think that might be fun. Maybe you will think that's fun. I don't know. Maybe sort of, kind of, sort of, but let's see. Let me check through some of the comments. I, I, I do get lost. I'm sorry if I wasn't able to read everybody's comments. Um, Cause then sometimes what happens is I get a little distracted reading and replying to stuff. And I noticed that's a little hard to watch live streams sometimes when um, you're constantly like going back in the comments because there's not a like story to follow. And personally, I like if there is some sort of story to follow, if that makes sense. And that's just a personal thing for me. So I'm hoping that the stuff I I do, you guys like. So uh, if I missed any of your comments, um, I will, after this live stream, as I'm eating my little late dinner, I will be reading these because I, I really don't want to miss any of the comments. So I, don't worry, I will read all of them. But let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's check. Oh, there's so many. You get so many other great shots of other spawning. Yeah, thank you. <gasps> you also have a, an, oh, I can't pronounce your name. The poll, oh, I'm not even going to try. Um, I have a notebook too. Yeah. I, I think that's really exciting. Oh, if any of you guys come to the Chicago Aquashella and you spawned uh, Betas before, or maybe you haven't, but you're planning on it. And if you're also kind of nerdy like me and have your own notebooks where you document things, I actually... I have, I go beyond the notebook. I have a whole, I have a whole binder of fish stuff right over here. And by the way, Sam, this is not, I just call Kelly. I just call you Sam. I just called you by your fish's name. <laughs> Kelly, I have your sticker that you sent me. Um, this is my binder of fish things. And this is where I have my studies that I print out. Cause I really try to make sure that the information that I share with you guys is the most accurate and like up to date as possibly can. So I'm always reading studies because it's very easy for us to just sort of um, develop an understanding of our fish through our experiences. But sometimes we may like connect the dots of things that maybe are not necessarily like correlate to why if that makes sense. So like that helps me keep a check. And then I also have my little basic um, fish like notebook here that I have like all my notes that I have like on cycling and beta genetics, which is something that's like totally my weak point. So I always write stuff down in that. And yeah, I got my thing. I also have my little printout. I guess this is since this is the end of the live stream, I just want to share because I haven't shared stuff with you guys in so long. I'm so excited. Um, this is for the previous spawn. So the for the unicorn bucket baby spawn, anytime I would ship out a beta, let me show it to you, I would I would cut these out and I would send these in. So it would be like a little like information packet where the we would put the number of the fish that you got and as well as information. So I would describe the type and then I have the birthday and the, who the parents are. And I thought that was like a cute little thing. Like you get to, when you have a fish for me, you get to know their birthday and you get to know like the parents and stuff. I haven't figured out. Oh, by the way, banana came. That's, that's really fun. Hey, banana. You want to come say hi as I continue to talk. Oh, super speedy border collie. If, if I can, I will try to bring banana to Aquashella, Chicago, if possible. Look at that. Look over here. Oh, you want kisses? Oh, is that the puppies? She's getting a little gray. She's um roughly about eight years old now. So she's getting a little older. But she's still very spunky and very, like, athletic and mobile. So I'm really happy about that. She's in good health. She's in good health. Oh, she's my babies. I wanted her to say hi, Pookie. Oh, you want to stay? Okay, if you want to stay, if you want to stay, we can hang out. I want, I want to set you free. But I thought it would be fun to just, I don't know, talk about all the things. It went from a live stream that had some structure at the beginning and then just kind of turned into a little hangout. But... I don't know. I thought it was really fun. And also what I was talking about earlier before I got distracted by cuteness. Let me let you go. 
gonna, you're gonna fall. I'm not, I'm not a good chair. I'm not a good, I'm not a good dobo chair. I'm not. But I will try to bring her to the um, Chicago Aqua Shell. It really depends on the venue. Um, sometimes the venues are like cool. You can bring an animal. Sometimes they're like you can only bring service animals. Um, I, I try to be respectful of the laws that are around service animals because even though Banana is very well trained, she's very well behaved. Um, nowadays, a lot of people do bring their dogs that are not service dogs to, to places where they shouldn't. And that makes it more difficult than for people who have actual legit service dogs to then bring their dogs because oftentimes they're told, no, you can't bring your dog, even though legally they should be able to. So I don't, I want to be very careful where I don't, you know, ruin it for someone else just because I really want to bring banana. So I want to, you know, follow the particular rules and stuff. And that note, <coughs> Daniel's here. That was very loud. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry if you're listening on headphones, but I think that will be my um, sign that we should end the live stream. I kind of didn't want to because you guys are fun, but Banana's doing a bark bark and my food is here. So on that note, I'm going to go. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. For those of you that will be hopefully maybe rewatching this um, in the future, if you missed it, uh, I'm glad that we still got to hang out, even though it wasn't live. And I hope that you guys had some fun. If you would like, uh, after this video kind of renders and then we'll be live on this, um, go up on this channel again. In the comments below, let me know if you would like for me to start live streaming more often again. Because this could be like a thing that I do once in a while. It could be like once a month kind of thing, if you prefer. Um, or potentially I could consider uh, live streams once a week. I don't really know. I think I want to base it more off what you guys would prefer. Um, personally... Uh, I miss a lot of live streams myself. I like I randomly popped into the other YouTuber I like, which by the way, her name is ASMR Alyssa. She does ASMR videos. I really like that. So I might as well just like give her a shout out. She's really nice. Um, I just randomly popped into like one of her live streams and I've, and, and I've missed a lot of hers in the past. And I know I missed a lot of the live streams in the fish tube community. So because it's so easy to miss them, I don't know if it would be too much if I live streamed every week or if you guys were okay with like a once a month thing. But I would probably maybe in the future let you guys know ahead of time and schedule a video so that instead of this like random like, hello, I'm here. I just popped up with no ex like warning or anything like poof, uh, which can be fun sometimes. I, I think it would be better if you guys have a little like heads up so you can know um, when to tune in. So for next week, there will be a aquarium co-op sponsored video, which I'm really excited about because I got some really nice things from Corey that um, I'm using in a tank that you'll get to see. And then I will continue to update you guys because I have all this footage that I still need to finish editing for the updates of like what happened to the spawn and what happened with all the spawn shenanigans. And I guess a summary that's shorter than 58 minutes of today, but I think, you know, this is just fun too. It's a fun thing. So yeah, I really appreciate that you guys took the time out of your day to hang out with me today and share all your comments and hung out with me. I hope that you have a lovely day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. And stream. Poo. Poo. Poo, poo, poo.